Hello? I am uh, the chief of sinners. I am the world champion sinner. That means out of all the great sinners in the entire world, I am the foremost. Not Vladimir Putin, not Adolf Hitler, not Judas Iscariot, but me. <laughs> and if you would care to argue with that, it's in the Bible. Check it out. You can read it. It's in the Bible. I'm the chief of sinners, and I am the world's most religious man. Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. It's in the Bible. Now, if you're thinking, well, who are you to know so much about the Bible? <laughs> well, I wrote it. <laughs> or at least uh, a lot of it. I wrote a lot of it. And I'm in it. Book of Acts tells my story. Acts 9, Ananias finds me in the house of Judas. I'm like a resurrected Judas, the 12th disciple. But public speaking is it's really not my, my forte. In Acts 20, one of my sermons went too long, and a kid named Uterus or Eutychus or something like that, he, he fell asleep, he fell out of the window, and he died, he died. But God in me raised him from the dead. So if the message kills you this morning, don't worry about it, all right? Forget about it. I got some notes here because, uh, like I said, I wasn't known for speaking ability, but I was known for my, for my letters. In fact, most of your New Testament is like my net letters, 13, 13 letters. I, it's actually kind of embarrassing because I didn't know I was writing the Bible at the time. Wouldn't have put some of them words in there that I put in there. 13 letters, including the letter to the Romans, which your pastor is preaching on. And in my entirely unbiased opinion, he's doing a remarkable job, a remarkable job. Many folks also think that I wrote the book of Hebrews, and let me just say I, I had some help, and I was a help. I taught those guys, I taught those guys all that stuff, particularly the stuff about tents. Inner tents, outer tents, lightweight backpacking tents, etc., etc. So I'm the chief of sinners, the world's most religious man. I wrote the Bible, the all time bestseller that hardly anybody believes. Folks, they think they believe, but they don't believe because they lack imagination. Faith is the ability to imagine what is actually true. But you modern people, you have a hard time imagining anything more than you can dissect and uh, comprehend and, and contain. That is anything more than dead things. So you don't really believe that there's a God, a living God, that could be telling a story and that you might be in his story. And so you modern people, you know billions and billions of facts, but you don't know what any of them mean. Because you don't know the plot. You're like mad scientists and Pharisees that way. And I was a Pharisee. I knew thousands and thousands of facts about scripture, but I didn't know what any of them meant. Didn't know the plot. We Pharisees dissected the, the word so we could comprehend the word and use the word to make our lives better. Sound familiar? And in that way, we crucified the plot. Like I said, chief of sinners, world's most religious man, unwitting author of the Bible, and a slightly above average tent maker. Many people don't realize this because it gets translated out by, by you know, people that don't know the plot, but the Bible, the Bible is really, it's all uh, ab about camping. <laughs> Did you know that? That's why it's so intense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got it. That's why it's so intense, all right? It's intense, it's intense. A little tent maker humor 
<laughs> forget about it. But anyway, the Bible, the Bible is really all about camping in tents and who gets to go in what tent and whose tent and how all of our tents could somehow one day turn into like a ginormous temple. Sometimes your Bible will read booth, sometimes tabernacle, but it's all basically tents, talking about tents. Sometimes your Bible will say dwell, like the word of God dwelt among us. The word is actually tent, like a, like a verb. Behold, the dwelling place, literally the tent of God is with man. He will tent with them and they will be his people. That's the revelation. So what exactly is God's intent? Yeah, yeah, bonus tent maker humor for you right there. Um, seriously though, what is God's intent? The Bible's all about tents. I was a tent maker and so I borrowed your pastor's, your pastor's tent. Set it up for you during that lovely song. It's a lovely song. Your pastor loaned me the tent. You know, really, I... Uh, I like your pastor so much. We, we connect, him and me. Sometimes when he's talking, it feels like I'm talking. Sometimes when I talk, you could imagine that it's him actually talking. Well, he says to me, sure, Tiny. That's what some people call me, Tiny. He says, sure, Tiny, you can, you can borrow my tent. He says, this is a very special tent, though. It's a home away from home. And think about it. Isn't that the idea with tents, a home, a home away from home? He says, a lot, of, a lot of great memories in this two-man pop tent. Me and my dad used to hike into the wilderness and camp in this tent after tending our cots and bruises and blisters after cooking the fish and eating the fried fish over the fire. After staring at the stars for, for hours, we, me and my dad, we would crawl into this tent. They said, now listen, some people got bad dads. Forget about that. He said, I had a good dad. So, when I was a tiny boy, he said, and even a bigger boy, but especially when I was a tiny boy, my dad would pull me close and tell me stories. Well, outside of the, the, outside of the tent, who knows what was wandering around in those dark and scary woods. I was a worrier, your pastor said to me, and I thought that I had a lot to worry about. I wasn't good at baseball or basketball. The kids up the street used to pick on me and I felt like I was just never enough. But my dad would pull me close and tell me about life on the farm when he was just a tiny boy and harrowing adventures in World War II and Stories about traveling around the world. And then he would find a way to tell me that in all of his stories, in all of his world, his favorite thing was me. Then I'd forget about him. I mean, I'd forget about me. And I would find myself in him. Lost in him. Outside of the tent, it felt like I was just never enough. But inside of the tent, that thought never even occurred to me. And I would fall into a delicious sleep. Shabbat, rest. Outside of the tent, I was constantly occupied with what had been and what might be. But inside the tent, I was perfectly content with right now. Outside the tent, I was always trying to be me. Felt like I couldn't be me. And always wondered, who is me? Why is me? And what's wrong with me? But inside the tent, in my father's arms, I, I am just who I am. I'm home. Your pastor started crying. <laughs> Big baby, it's a weenie. 
Anyway, I'm chief of sinners, most religious, author of the Bible, a tent maker, and a Pharisee. I wasn't very good at basketball or baseball, but I was great at religion. Great at religion. And I should probably mention that in Latin, tiny is pronounced Paulus. My Hebrew name is Saul. That's Rabbi Saul, as in the great Rabbi Saul. But my friends all call me Paul. And I'm here to talk about Easter for me. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, and they quote me. Jesus appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then more than 500 at one time, then James and all the apostles, and last of all, it's one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now you can read about how that happened in Acts 6 to 9, chapter 22, chapter 26, Galatians chapter, chapter 1. Easter for me came a short time after Jesus was crucified, and while the news of his resurrection was spreading like wildfire to the countryside, I was on my way from Jerusalem to Damascus, Damascus with orders from the high priest to, 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 to seize followers of Christ, deliver them up to, to, to prison and even, and even to death. It was a form of religious genocide. Like I said, chief of sinners. So you might rightfully ask, tiny, how did you get so evil? Well, you know, I got so evil by wanting to make myself so good. I wanted to save my life and save my nation's life. I kind of even felt like it was my job to save God's life. I convinced myself that I was the savior. Do you think that Adolf Hitler wanted to be evil? Do you? He told himself that he was saving Germany. Do you think that Vladimir Putin wants to be evil? He tells himself that he's saving Russia. And so any threat to Putin is also a threat to Russia because he's the savior of Russia. And not a tiny one, but a big one. Do you think that Caiaphas wanted to be evil? Or do you think that he told himself he was the savior of Israel? Do you think I wanted to be evil? I, I wanted to save Israel and make everyone good, and that's why I persecuted the unpatriotic f followers of Jesus. I grew up in the diaspora in Tarsus, 600 miles north of Jerusalem. But as a young man, I made the journey to Jerusalem in order to study under the feet of the great rabbi Gamaliel. I was so zealous for my God and for my country that I excelled beyond my peers. And in my mind, even beyond Gamaliel, and, and that would make some sense since we were Pharisees. It means the separated one. We liked being different. We liked being special. We liked being the best and the first. But Jesus seemed to have a thing for the last and for the least. He had a disregard for our religion. 1,500 years of tradition and commentary, Halakha and Mishnah on the law of Moses. He even talked about the destruction of the temple. And we've been building it for like a 1,000 years, a 1,000 years. So, I was thrilled when they got rid of him. And I was furious when it seemed like he just wouldn't go away. I was there when we killed the first one. His name was Stephen. We, we drug him before the council. And when he stood up to make his defense, he told about the tent of witness in the wilderness. But then he defamed our temple in Jerusalem. It's, it's true that his face began to glow like an angel with light, but, but I told myself it was a trick. And then we pummeled him to death with stones. 
And then I went on a rampage. Old men, women, little children. I drug them all before the council and delivered them up to death. And it happened on more than one occasion that one of them would, would look at me. Once a little girl looked at me. And she said, Abba, forgive him because he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> and, and I knew Deuteronomy 5. Uh, Deuteronomy 5, that our God is one and his law is love. I, I knew that. But by trying to make myself love and make all of Israel love, I began to hate love and despise God. I was trying to run from God, impress God, and be God all at once. The harder I tried to be good, the more I felt the shackles of evil. I drug people off to prison, but they was free, and I was in bondage. Uh, they was alive, and I was dead and dying. I was not the savior of Israel. I was the Israel that needed saving. There's a difference. So like I was saying, I was on my way from Jerusalem to Damascus, breathing threats of great violence, when suddenly a bright light, brilliant, and even all the sun had shone all around me. It knocked me into the dust, into Adam's dust. And the voice said this, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you? And the voice said, Jesus, whom you are persecuting, and he said, I'm calling you to be a witness. Kind of like Stephen, I would suppose. <laughs> or that tent in the wilderness, the tent of witness. And he said, I'm, I'm delivering you, and I will deliver you, as if, as if I was in prison. And then he said, I'm sending you to open the eyes of the goyim, the Gentiles, the enemy. I'm sending you to open the eyes. And then all of a sudden I realized I was blind. To make a long story short, Easter killed me. Utterly annihilated me. That's me in the corner. That's me in the spot. Light losing my religion. Easter judged me, undid me, utterly destroyed me, such that it's no longer I who live, <laughs> but somebody else. In my own words, Second Thessalonians, and uh, I, I quote me, I suffered the punishment of eternal destruction, Ionios destruction, that comes from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. I was brought to nothing by the manifestation of his appearing, the epiphanao of his parisio. But that was just the edge of Easter. <laughs> For the eternal destruction is also the eternal construction. The death of death is also the presence of eternal life. And that's what the book of Romans is all about. And that's why I borrowed your pastor's tent. Like, 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 like I was saying, the Bible is really all about camping in tents and who gets into what tent and who gets into whose tent and how all of our tents could somehow turn into like one ginormous temple. If you've read through your Bible, some of you maybe, if you've read through your Bible, you probably got bogged down around Exodus chapter 25, right? Because the Bible's got a lot of like drama, really interesting stuff like murders and affairs and, and, and he's, he's got some valuable information like the Ten Commandments, but it's only one page, the Ten Commandments, and then Exodus 25. And God starts talking about tents. And he keeps talking about tents. I mean, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, on and on and on. It keeps talking. It's all about this, this crazy tent inside of this other tent inside of a, a, a courtyard and what you need to do to get into the innermost tent. It's God's tent. And it can kill you. Unless you're the high priest and you've obeyed the law and you've made the sacrifices, you enter 
by blood. Freaky, huh? In the book of Hebrews, we explain that the outer tent, the courtyard, represents the present age, the present ion. That's where the priests and the people could roam about pretty much as they, as they would, kind of. But the inner sanctuary behind the veil is like the presence of the age, the ion to come. It's Ionios, the, the seventh day, when it is finished and everything, everything is good. But they can kill you. <laughs> Crazy, huh? The inner tent is rest. It's the tent of I am that I am. It's eternal. And that means that the inside is bigger than all the outside. All of space, all of time. And yet even that tent is a picture of a more perfect tent, not made by human hands, eternal in the heavens, although at that time no one knew exactly what that meant or, or where that was, the heavens. 500 years after God gave all those instructions to Moses in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and once Israel thought that they were done camping, King David, you heard of him? King David, he offered to build God a temple. And God, check this out, he seemed to be really perturbed at the idea. Because he wanted to move around with his people in, in the tent and didn't like the idea of getting stuck in a stone box or something. And yet, he does tell David that a son of David will build him a house. Well, I can see that some of you are glazing over a little bit, just like uterus and, and your pastor. You know, your pastor said to me, actually, he said, Tiny, you know, all that talk about tents and temples, I, I find it kind of boring. And I looked at him, and I quoted myself from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I said, don't you know? Don't you know that you, that you all are God's temple? See, that means that when God is describing the temple and the tabernacle and the inner sanctuary, God is describing the very depths of you. And where do you suppose is that perfect tent set up by God, not by any human hands, eternal in the heavens? Jesus said this to the, to, check this out, to the Pharisees he said this. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Yowza. Then check this out. This is what I said. Don't you know, First Corinthians, don't you know that you all are God's temple? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. That's crazy. Destroy him who is God's temple. Destroy him, and I would suppose rebuild him because he's God's temple. Destroy and rebuild. And that's what Jesus and the Easter is all about. So anyway, let's talk about Easter for me. In Romans 7, 9, I wrote this. I was once alive apart from the law. The law is the knowledge of good and evil. I was once alive, so folks naturally ask, when was that, Tiny? And I'm suggesting that you are now dead. When was that? Well, that was when I was at peace with God in the Garden of Eden. And folks will say, you're not Adam. But of course I am Adam, because as your pastor has clearly explained to you, Adam means man or, or mankind. And then folks will say, well, where's the Garden of Eden? As your pastor has clearly explained, the Garden of Eden is in the innermost tent, past the sword of the high priest, behind the curtain and between the two cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant. The Garden of Eden is in the inner tent, in the depths of the temple that is... You, you listening now, huh? When I was a tiny Adam, sorry for yelling, I just, uh, see I'm not, that's my, anyway. When I was a tiny Adam, I talk to them a tiny voice. When I was just a little Adam, a little guy, I had no knowledge of good and evil. But just like every tiny Adam, there came a moment when I took knowledge of good and evil. I can't even remember it now. But a moment when I took knowledge of good and evil and I began to judge myself. 
in the hope of making myself like my dad, my creator, who is good. But just by doing that, I began to believe that I was my own creator. I began to grow what I think you folks normally call an ego. And what I would call an old Adam, a false self, a body of sin and death, a psychic body, translated soul by some of you, a psychic body, much like my physical body. And the problem with my physical body is it only feels its own pain and its own pleasure. I call it the flesh. And it's built with sin. Built with the desire to save yourself. Like your pastor has been teaching you. It's remarkable, really, how much I agree with him. Like he's been teaching you, you each have a true self who is God's judgment. It's the me that, that God, I am that I am, has created. It's the self who trusts that God is salvation, a true self. And you also have, ow, a false self who is your own judgment. It's the me that you think you have created, and it is the self that thinks you are your own salvation. Get back in Genesis 2. Adam took the knowledge of good and evil and tried to make himself in the image of God, and he was exiled from the garden. In the very same way, every tiny Adam takes knowledge of good and evil and tries to create his own life, and he is exiled from himself, the innermost tent. So this is the situation of every atom that has become self-conscious. You, you have a life, so to speak. You, you have a, a psyche, a world that you have built. It's constructed with your decisions and your choices and your judgments. It's what I call the flesh. And in that way, you see, it's kind of like this beautiful old stone building built in 1920 with human hands. It's just like the outer courts of the tabernacle that became the stone temple. Very nice. But you worry about this thing that you call your life because it's threatened. It's threatened by other lives. And, as you know, it's fallen apart. In other words, the older you get, the more you know that something is wrong with the me that you have created. It's lonely as hell. And it's dying. And the truth is, it's been dead ever since you left the garden, the garden in the tent in the temple that is you. So this is your situation. You are alone in a world that is crumbling. You're alone in an age that's coming to an end. You're dying. And so you naturally are asking, what does it all mean? What does it all mean? You're a crumbling old stone temple, but in the depths of this old stone temple that you think is you, There's a tent. And what's in the tent? Well, the same thing that was in the innermost tent, in the tabernacle that God told Moses to build in the wilderness. In the tent is the Ark of the Covenant. And what's in the Ark? <laughs> now, pay attention. Remember your Bible. The Ark is literally a coffin made of wood, made of tree. Eights, all one word in Hebrew. And in the coffin is the knowledge of good and evil, written on stones. That's dead knowledge. 
have some, as if someone had taken the life of wisdom and knowledge on a tree, put it in a coffin. But on top of the ark that is a tree, there is the blood of sacrifice. And the life is in the blood. The top of the ark is called the mercy seat. My friend John, he had this amazing vision. And on the mercy seat, which is the throne of God, he saw a lamb standing as if it had just always, as if it had just been freshly slain. Do you understand the plot to the whole story, the meaning of all things, is in the innermost tent, in the depths of the temple, that is you. But the plot is guarded by the cherubim on top of the ark, just like the cherubim that guarded the way to the tree of life. Eternal life is guarded by the cherubim, and a knife, a sword of the high priest, and a curtain separating the innermost tent from where you are, the outermost temple. So we each exist in a house that is crumbling, like this, uh, like this old stone temple. We ex exist in a house that is uh, crumbling, and we're haunted. It's a haunted house. We're haunted with a voice from behind the curtain in the depths of your soul. You know when Jesus appeared to me on the, remember the story I told you when he appeared to me on the road to Damascus, shining like the sun, you know, knock me on my can, all that stuff, brighter than the, he said this to me, Saul, it's hard for you. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And if you don't know, goads are for herding goats, not sheep. So it's, it's hard for you. It's, it's hard for you. And you see, I, I was, that's true, it was hard. For, I was being goaded. I was being goaded by the voice of love to every person I had per persecuted, particularly when they said, Father, forgive him. And I was being goaded by the very same voice that came from behind the curtain in the temple in the depths of my soul, what you often call a conscience. You got one, right? I was condemned. My house was condemned. From the outside in and from the inside out. I knew that I was dead and dying. A prisoner in the prison, that was me. The harder I tried to be good, all the more evil I actually became. The harder I tried to be free, the deeper I sank into the bondage, that was me. The harder I tried to live, the more I grew terrified to die, and yet was already dead. Romans 7, 24, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You understand? The body of death is like this old stone temple. It's my religion. I don't know what you thought I meant by the flesh, but it's my confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3. Circumcised on the, and I quote me, circumcised on the eighth day, snip, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. <laughs> so what exactly is this body of, of death? Well, it's the work of my ego. It's the life that I have built. It's all my choices made in an effort to save myself, redeem myself, and justify myself. It's what your pastor calls Mises. This is Mises. This is the result of my choice. And what is God's choice? It's this tent. And what's in this tent? On the other side of the curtain. God's choice is is Jesus. The name means God is salvation. So can you see that in the unmitigated presence of Jesus, and that's what he was on the road to Damascus, 
and the unmitigated presence of Jesus, God is salvation, utterly destroys Mises. <laughs> Built with the belief that I am salvation. Destroys it like a bad dream upon waking. Like a shadow destroyed by the light. Like a lie destroyed by the truth. Like pride destroyed by the consuming fire that is the love of God. Big old important rabbi soul died on the road to Damascus. And tiny Paul was born. He was set free to be me. <laughs> the real me. It happened in a moment and yet it took a lifetime. To die to myself and rise from the prison that I thought once thought was me. That took a lifetime. I, I was blinded by Jesus who is the light. Jesus had Ananias pray for my sight. He told Ananias, don't worry, Ananias, because Ananias was, well, he knew my story. He said, don't worry, Ananias. I will show him he will see what he must suffer for my name. My religion was Mises, and it dies in the presence of Jesus. That's his name. And so... That's me in the corner. That's me in the spotlight, losing my religion. Philippians 3, 8, and I quote me. I have suffered the loss of all things. Hebrew born of Hebrews, as the righteousness of the law, blameless. I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as shit for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. But you see, I couldn't make that happen. Why? because then that would just be more Mises. I had to watch that happen. And that's the resurrection of Jesus. From the tomb that was Mises, the resurrection of Jesus, that's Easter to me. That's Easter in me. That's Easter through me. So, so I wrote. Romans 7, wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. And then I wrote, there were no chapter divisions in the Bible when I wrote it. It was a letter. Wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. And then I wrote, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus my Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now you do know that it was Mises and all my brothers that took the life of Jesus on the tree in the mountain, on, on, in the garden, on the very mountain where Solomon built the temple and where Adam took, took the fruit, right? If, if, if that, if that, taking the life of Jesus is not the chief of sins, I don't know what is. And yet it's a sin that all the children of Adam have committed. Well, when you come back to the tree, you cannot help but see what it is that all of our self-righteousness ha has accomplished. What has our self-righteousness accomplished? The crucifixion of the righteousness of God. It's the knowledge of evil. That's what we have accomplished. At the tree, we took the knowledge of God and crucified the life of God, forever condemning the arrogant illusion that I thought, I thought was me. But there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, for they see that they have already been condemned. They see that all this self-righteousness is scubala. It's just shit. In Jesus, God condemned sin in the flesh. And then at the end of this age, the edge of the next days, Jesus cried, Father, forgive them. It is finished. And then he delivered up his spirit. Matthew 27, 51, at that moment, behold, the curtain of the temple, the curtain between the outer temple and the innermost tent, it ripped. Ripped from top to bottom, Hebrews 10, 20. That curtain is his flesh. You see, Jesus is, some people think he's different than the Father, but Jesus is the Spirit of God our Father, having left the throne of God in order to find us and bring each of us home to the Father's tent. 
And yet, and yet get this, he was with us all along in the inner sanctuary of our wayward souls just as he journeyed with ancient Israel on their way to the promised land that was him. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the bus that takes us on a ride, a ride through death and home to life, a ride through hell and home to heaven where we say thank you, a ride through the valley of the shadow and home to our Father's tent. And what does it all mean? <laughs> it all means Romans chapter 8. It means you can walk according to the flesh, it seems. It seems that you can do that for a time. In other words, you can go about that thing that you call your life in the outer courts of the temple. You can set your mind on yourself, <laughs> constantly judging yourself, judging your neighbor, terrified of the coming judgment of God, constantly wondering, am I good enough or am I too evil? Constantly trying to love but unable to love because love is losing yourself and then finding yourself in another. Constantly trying to save yourself but unable to save yourself for it's yourself from which you must be saved. Constantly too terrified to die yet wanting to die but unable to die for you can't kill yourself with yourself. Somebody else has got to do it for you. Constantly haunted by your past terrified of your future, and so unable to live right now. See, you can exist in the outer courts of the temple in this age of space and time. Or you can live in the inner tent. That's Christ, in Christ, the life of the age to come. In other words, you can you can now enter his rest. You can, you can go in to the innermost sanctuary. That's why, that's why I wrote Romans 7, 21, 22. I delight together with someone in the law, like, like a living law, in my innermost man, my innermost tent, so right now, you can say, Dad, I'm scared that I'm not enough for you. And right now, you can hear the Father's voice. You, my dear, are in me, and I am in you. I am your blood, and that, my son, my daughter, is more than enough. Right now, you can hear his story and your story. I'm making you in my image, and I will not fail for it's finished, and soon you will see everything good. Right now, you can lose your psyche and find it in his as he tells you the story. I made the stars. I made the fish, and I'm the fire. And out of everything that I made, you're my favorite. Right now, you can hear the blessing of God from within the body of Jesus. You are my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Right now, you can enter his tent and say, Abba, Dad, I'm home. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When I say, Abba, Daddy, that big old important rabbi soul dies. And Paul, tiny Paul, he rises from the dead. And God in tiny Paul is more than a conqueror. 
more than conquers the world, the entire world, all of space and all of time. Anyone, anyone in Christ is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. See, it's like I said. The inside of the tent is bigger than all of space and time. And in this world, all of space and time in this world of space and time, the tent grows until all of space and time is in the tent and everything old has become forever new. In Israel, we had uh, three feasts, three feasts that everyone participated in. Okay, check this out. The first was Passover. Jesus died on Passover, and he is the first fruits of a new creation, firstborn from the dead. Second feast was Pentecost. On Pentecost, the Spirit, his Spirit, Jesus' Spirit, filled the church that is his body in this world, who is also the first fruits. Now, first fruits means that there's other fruits, right? The third feast was the Feast of Tabernacles, <laughs> the Feast of Tents. You didn't think that you were the only fruits, did you? I mean, you didn't think that God could do this saving you, redeeming you thing, and then he was just like out of mojo or something. You, you're not the only fruits. Pentecost came at the harvest of the wheat. That's bread. Tabernacles came at the harvest of the grapes. That's wine. It was also called the Feast of in gathering for everything that hadn't been harvested was harvested at tabernacles at tabernacles all of israel would go outside of of uh, their stone houses in the old city of jerusalem and they would live in tents as they did when they journeyed to the promised land and at the end of seven days like the days of creation they would pack up their tents and they would go back into the city and on the eighth day which uh, for jews like me is an endless seven Seventh day, on the eighth day, they would feast in a new Jerusalem. And that, that is only a picture of the new Jerusalem that is coming down right now, the moment you enter the innermost tent. We love because he first loved us. My friend John wrote that. <laughs> We love because he first loved us, and nothing is more powerful than love. God is love, and God is telling the story, and love is his intent. There's a legend that God once sought the advice of a wise man. He said to this wise man, I want to play a game of hide and seek with Adam, with humanity. To play hide and seek is to create a desire, think about it, for that which is sought. Isaiah wrote, truly, you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Well, anyway, God said to this wise man, he said, I want to play a game of hide and seek with humanity. I've asked my angels, where's the best place to hide? Uh, some of them said, the depths of the sea, some of them said, you know, uh, maybe the highest mountain. Some of them said the, the other side of the moon. So God said to this wise man, what do you suggest? Wisdom, he thought for a moment, and then he said, hide in the human heart. <laughs> That's the last place they will think to look. It's just a, a legend. I, uh, but I, I do think that God likes to play hide and seek, but a particular version of hide and seek, a version that I would play with my family when I was a tiny boy, I think you call it uh, sardines. In sardines, someone hides and everyone looks for them. And when you find them, you join them. And pretty soon everybody is packed into a Tiny tent, like sardines in a, in a can, and somebody giggles. And then somebody laughs, and then everybody gets found. Someone once wrote this. God will be found 
the way everybody gets found in sardines. By the sound of the laughter of everyone heaped together in the end. Jesus is the end. And that's the plot. All things filled with love. That's God's intent. The children cry, Ollie, Ollie, oxen tree, when they play hide and seek. Your English scholars think that that comes from this phrase, all ye, all ye outs, come in free. You see, I think that's a perfect description of the Father's intent. Grace. That's what he accomplishes. And that's the good. And that's how you will live when you live your life from his tent. Free. And now I should mention why it is that I'm dressed as a, as a prisoner. It isn't because I used to drag people off to prison, which I did. And it isn't simply because when I appeared to be free, I was actually in prison, which I was. It's because I spent so much of my adult life in prison. <laughs> And yet I had never actually been so free. Never so free as when Jesus set me free of me. <laughs> Once my friend Silas and me, we were chained in stocks in Philippi. It was our first trip to Europe, Acts 17. Chained in stocks, and now I quote, in the innermost prison. But we, me and Silas, went into the innermost tent. And there, together in the dark, we started singing. And then we kind of started laughing. And the other prisoners, they were listening to us. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, and the doors sprang open, and the chains, they fell off. And Silas and I... We evangelized Europe. <laughs> yeah, how's that? And it wasn't toil or work. That's what it is when you walk according to the flesh. But it wasn't work. It was worship. It was Easter. And so, Jesus took bread and he broke it saying, this is, my, this is my body given to you. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Pour it out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, drink of this, all of you, and do it in the remembrance of me. Do you see that all of this, all of this is in this? The innermost tent, the holy of holies. See, I think Christ is, he's inviting you. He's inviting you to hide in him and hear the voice of our Father. So would you just, just close your eyes? And in the depths of your being, you just go as deep as you can go. And in that place, you, you can whisper this or just in silence in your heart, say, Abba, Dad, I'm home. Then listen to his voice. I am so happy, for you are 
and you will always be my beloved. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation is able to separate you from me and my love for you. When you leave this place, this place leaves with you and in you. And that's Easter. You know, these have been scary times, right? I mean, this is uh, COVID, and then the threat of nuclear war, kind of all reminding us of what we all knew was true. <laughs> We're dead and dying. Hebrews chapter 2, Paul, or his buddies, reveals the devil, this is what he writes, the devil keeps us in lifelong bondage through the fear of death. But you see, you cannot fear death once you've come to believe that eternal life has pitched his tent in the sanctuary of your soul and that the door to the tent is always open. So happy Easter. You can't fear death if you're already dead and if eternal life lives in your soul. And suddenly you become very dangerous to the principalities of this world because you know that your Redeemer lives and he lives in you, he lives through you. He's pitched his tent in you with his people, his body, and he will not fail. And soon you will see it. Everything good in Jesus' name. And then we will say thank you and worship and worship and worship. So in Jesus' name, this is really all that I'm saying, but it's dreadfully important. Believe the gospel. Amen.